He's one of the main pastors here at this church. So if you have any questions about uh, First United Methodist, please see her. And she's going to do our prayer this morning. You want to do that now? And then I'll introduce the speaker. What a way to start out a day with a prayer, right? Well, I, have, I have a little quote to share. So I got... Um, I am Dee Dee Autry. I'm one of the pastors here. So good morning and welcome again today. I hope your day yesterday was awesome. Um, I was recently gifted this book called I Really Needed This Today. It's by Hoda Cod- Codby, if any of you guys watched the Today Show. Um, and it's just full of really cool little quotes. And this morning I read it and I thought of you guys um, at, in light of being caregivers. Um, and the quote is, be kind For everyone you meet is fighting a a battle you know nothing about. It's easy to forget how much is going on for people as they navigate their day. At work, in traffic, on a plane. Being kind to someone who's acting poorly can be hard. But maybe they're just losing the battle in that moment. I bet we'll run into one or five people today who are fighting a silent battle. So I often think of caretakers, especially, um, who maybe have had a really hard day, and then you go out, and you go to the grocery store, and you just lose it. Uh, Whether you're a mom caring for children, or caring for aging parents, or or, uh, older adults, whatever it might be, sometimes we just... We're just having a hard time, and that just made me think about you guys this morning and all that you're learning, and especially probably what Missy's going to bring to you guys today. So I hope that brings a positive word to you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for, again, a day that we can welcome you and where you have already welcomed us. And so as these people gather in this space to learn and to grow and to experience something new, we ask, Lord, that you bless them, that you provide them opportunity to hear a new word, uh, to make a new connection, to create network and community, and just perhaps to make a new friend. So God, we ask that you bless them. Uh, May their time be fruitful and meaningful. Uh, We are thankful for Missy and for all that she will bring to them this morning and today as they gather. Um, May this day just be a blessing for all who are here today. And we just pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so a little exercise this morning. Uh, Missy's going to be doing all of the presentations today. She's very entertaining and very knowledgeable. She's going to have a lot of group activities. So we need at least four people at each table. So if you're sitting by yourself, please um, join somebody else so we can have four people at each table. So while I introduce Missy, she's an author, writer, speaker, many topics on aging and faith. Um, She's written some great books. It's in your program, but um, Living with a Purpose in a Worn Out Body, Um, Talking with God in Old Age, My favorite, don't write my obituary yet. So anyway, um, I'm really, really, we're really blessed and lucky to have her here today to speak to you guys. I'm sorry we we, uh, have some stragglers coming in, but we'll have a few more people throughout the morning probably join us. She's a native of Texas as Jared and I were talking, that's God's country, right? (laughs) Anyway, Missy loves spending time with her family, including her husband, Barry, who actually brought her here this morning. And so without further ado, please give a round of applause for Missy Buchanan. Thank you. Y'all are going to be really sick of me by the end of the day, but we're going to try to make it fun, all right? And let me just say, there, there are many speakers that... Um, speak on clinical issues, medical issues, you know, things like that. 
but I'm all about heart issues and about, particularly about aging faithfully and how that's different than just growing older. Um, although I'll not be spending a lot of time on faith issues, I think you'll see it woven through. But I hope that um, what you'll come away with is more of that heart to heart, how your heart as a caregiver impacts the care recipient and vice versa, and family members as well. Okay, now if you saw this slide earlier that had the second picture, I want you to pretend you didn't see it. You're going to need your notebook and your paper, and I want you to write down who this is. Now, it could be a politician, it might be a sports person, it could be someone in the entertainment world. Who is this as a younger person? Write it down, just take a guess. Don't tell your neighbor if you know. Okay, everybody got an answer? All right, let's see who got it. Anybody guess George Clooney? George Clooney, well done. Well done. Pretty interesting, isn't it? In this case, aren't we glad people age, really? Yeah. <laughs> All right, here's your first activity. I want you to write down the first five words or phrases that you think of, just pop into your mind when you think of, of aging. What are just that? Just, just don't give it thought, just jot them down real fast. Don't look at your neighbors now. Somebody shout out your answer. One of your answers. Wrinkles. What was it? Retirement. Retirement. What else? High blood pressure. I'm not dead yet. Wisdom. Bingo. Frustration. What was it? Using prescriptions. Those are good ones. These are really good thoughts. Do you see how many different directions we're coming from? Just on the topic of aging. So back to our good friend, George Clooney. You may remember that back in uh, 2000, there was a movie called The Perfect Storm. Any of you see it? Okay. Even if you didn't, you can follow right along because in this movie... It was actually like two hurricanes coming together. I mean, it was a massive storm. It wasn't our, our afternoon thunderstorms in Texas or whatever. It was a massive, massive storm. It was the perfect storm. See that boat in that second picture? Okay, keep that image in mind. Because today's older adults are experiencing a perfect storm. Let me explain what I mean by that. Just as they think that their minds and their bodies are slowing down, the world has never gone faster. Think about that. It is different for someone who's, say, 85 today than it was for someone who was 85 30 years ago, 50 years ago. It is a massive storm. They are living in the perfect storm. There, these two things are colliding. Slowing down of mind and body, the world is going faster. My friend Robin Roberts, and I'll explain a little bit of that as we go on, but back in 2005 when Katrina came through, you may have actually seen her on, on uh, Good Morning America that morning when they had sent her back to the past Christian uh, Gulfport area to report, keeping in, her, in mind that her mother still lived in that, and sister still lived in that area. And she was just blown away by what she saw. And she said, I couldn't find my way through a town I knew so well. 
There were no street signs. There were piles of debris where familiar uh, houses and buildings once stood. I totally lost my bearings and struggled to even find my way to my mother's street. Everything I knew had vanished or had changed so much that I didn't recognize it. It was the most surreal experience of my life. Friends, this is what a lot of our care recipients, our aging parents, this is what they are experiencing. Where everything feels totally unfamiliar, lost. No generation has been thrown as much change so fast as today's seniors. If you leave here with just one thing today, I want you to leave with that. Because it should put into perspective for you what older adults are experiencing and how it's impacting everything about their lives. What's different for uh, seniors today is the pace of change. Change has always happened. We know that. It's just that it has sped up so much. For a person in their 80s today, communication for most of their life has been like this. The rotary phone, a pay phone. Better? Yeah. Yay, Trevor. Okay, here we go. So the rotary phone, the pay phone, the wall phone. I remember as a, as a kid having that wall phone and we had an extra long cord so you could walk around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, then we got to the push button. I mean, we're really getting on up there. Writing. We wrote letters. There was no email. We wrote letters. We did everything by hand. The typewriter, manual typewriter. I remember being in college and working on my master's thesis, and I said it took me longer to type it than it did to write it because I kept having to, you know, I'd, I'd be typing and go on the I'd be off the end of the paper before I knew it and whatever, you know, just things like that. The brownie camera, anybody have one? I tried to explain this to my grandkids about film 
and how, you know, I said when we went on vacation as a kid, I thought I was doing great if I had a roll of 24 pictures. And I said, then you had to decide, was this worth taking one of your pictures for? Because you never knew, you know, it's like I might see something better down the way. You with me? That was totally foreign to them. And then movie cameras. But keep in mind, this has been the foundation of their communication. Their foundational years. All right, activity two. I want you to write down every piece of technology that you see in that picture. Go. Work on it kind of as a group if you need to help one another on this one. Okay, just for time's sake, I'm going to get us started here. So we see the boombox, the video camera, CDs, DVDs, VHS tapes, keyboard, a transistor radio, earphones. What else do you see? Calculator. Walkman iPod, I didn't, was there Polaroid film in that one, okay, okay, you're with me, right, by the digital age of the mid-1980s, today's 85-year-old had already lived almost 50 years, keep that in mind, keep that in mind when we're so quick to criticize an older adult for not embracing technology. Realize how fast it's all happening. And it's all right here. It's all right here, plus thousands of other things, many of which I've yet to learn. I've got to ask my grandkids so they can show me. 2007, the first iPhone came out. 2007. That's 15 years ago, y'all. The first iPhone. Someone who is 85 years old today would have been 70 years old when that iPhone first came out. Keep that in perspective. A few years ago, I met a woman in her late 90s who became teary when she was talking about FaceTime. She said, oh, I wish we had had this during World War II. I went for months not knowing where my husband was or if he was even alive. In 1950, only 9% of homes had a television. One out of 11 homes. It was a big deal to have a television. And they were big and bulky. And this was before we went to the, like in the cabinets and whatever. Today, 99% of homes have a television. The average home has at least three. In my youth, it was ABC, NBC, and CBS. Did it stay on 24-7? No. 
And what happened when it went, like at the end of the evening when it went off? Yeah, yeah. So there was a definite beginning and an end. And now all these platforms plus so many more that we don't even know sometimes where to go to find. We have to Google how to watch the show, or at least I do. It's like, I know I want to see this, but I have no idea what it's on. Yeah. Remotes. Every time we stay in a, particularly like in a um, VRBO or Airbnb or something, and they'll have three remotes, and I'm like looking at them trying to figure out which one do I do, I do first? I mean, what, what one do I use first? Because there's a remote for this, there's a remote for that, or maybe you've got one of the slick deals and it's all now on one remote. But for many of us, we're still struggling with, oh, you got to do this one first, turn it on with that. You change the volume thing on this one, but this is the one that you get over if you're going to watch a movie on Netflix. So many different things, and we wonder why our older adults are struggling with that. Let me tell you the story of my mother and a remote. My mother has uh, been gone since 2008, and in this picture, she was like in her early, she was about, probably about 84, I would say. And as she aged, um, I think I've got to say, yeah, this is a picture of her at Halloween one year, and we, we decorated her um, scooter as a, or her power chair as a race car because it was a thing that was my mother didn't even know what NASCAR was so we had a great time I had to explain it to her and we had her all decorated up for that but by the time she was in her 90s um, she had grown much more frail the, the bone in her hip had fused and you know they weren't willing to do surgery didn't they were worried about her coming through the all the rehab that followed and whatever and so you know she was just dealing with the chronic pain and whatever of that we had caregivers that came in she was living in a senior community but it was independent living that's where she and my dad had lived after he was gone she really wanted to stay there and we understood so we brought caregivers in and then I was there each day to kind of oversee all of that well I came in one day, and you had to know my mother to know that she was very even-tempered. I mean, I, I can probably count on one hand the times that I heard her raise her voice even in my lifetime. She was very even-tempered and very easy to get along with. But on this particular day when I came in, she was flustered and she was upset. And I was trying to figure out what it was because the morning caregiver had been there. I came in midday, and then we had another caregiver that came in the evening. And so as I was talking with my mother, I, she, was, she kept saying something about the television. And I said, well, what about the television? And she had one in the living room, but then she, in her bedroom, there was one that was mounted on the wall. And she needed to use her remote. While she was showering or whatever, the caregiver had changed the channel. But my mother didn't know it. Okay. My mother was upset, very upset, because she... It was all she could do to point that remote at just the right point to get it to come on, much less to change the channel. Because she, when she's doing this, she couldn't see where the, where the numbers were. She was so frustrated because she had one channel. She liked ABC News. That was her favorite. And as she was able to articulate it to me, I began to understand and I could have conversation with the caregiver, do not change my mother's television station. Because you see, that was one of the last bits of independence that my mother had, was being able to turn that on and off when she wanted to watch the show that she wanted. She was fearful of changing the channel because she couldn't get back to her preferred station. So what someone may have seen is just her being persnickety. There was a reason, a very foundational reason, that, and we need to understand that. To care well for older adults is to appreciate the gravity of the dramatic changes they've experienced in the course of their lives. This is hugely important for you to understand as caregivers, as family, and as a person who's aging as well. We all are. 
Encyclopedias. Has anybody tried to sell any encyclopedias lately? Let me just say, nobody wants them. Or at least not in our area, not in the Dallas area. We downsized almost 15 years ago. We could not give them away. We thought certainly there would be, you know, an underserved school or something like that would be so thrilled to have our encyclopedias. And they're like, no, thank you. No, thank you. We ended up putting them in the commercial shredder. That broke our hearts because these were the encyclopedias that when we were having dinner at the table and one of the kids had a question, that person got up, got the encyclopedia, brought it back and found the answer and read it to us. That was the foundation. That was what we did. And then all of a sudden, nobody wants them and you can't give them away. One lady said, my husband and I sacrificed to buy a set of encyclopedias so that our children would have every possible advantage to learn. Now that we are old, we've discovered that no one wants them. When we planned trips, it was with fold-out maps and by riding to the chambers of commerce in faraway towns or to AAA. Yes, I see some heads bobbing. If you're of my generation, that's exactly what we did. And... If we wanted to figure out how far it was from here to there, and it was not on a major road, you had to add up all these little segments of it, you know, and hope you got the math right. That's what we did. We sent off, to, you know, in a magazine you might see there was a, a thing for Hot Springs, Arkansas, and you rode off to the chamber and you got excited when two weeks later these materials planned, but it wasn't like you just planned it in like, you know, in a, in a heartbeat. You had to plan far out. That's what we did. Instead of mocking older adults for not adapting quickly to the latest technology, we should be in awe of the skills that they have accumulated over the years. Never forget the amount of change that they've endured. One of my friends, a few years ago, after the Super Bowl 2019, he said, nothing reminds me how out of touch I am with the world than the halftime show of the Super Bowl. Where are the marching bands, he said. And I didn't realize it was not until the 19, early 90s. Uh, let's see, uh, Michael Jackson was 1993. I think that was the really first big, big celebrity thing. Before that, they had had, like, up with people. But they had marching bands up to that point and whatever, you know. And now it's turned into this huge production. And, you know, for him, that was like... I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. There was an older man that was uh, at one of the, it was a retreat that I was leading, and we were talking about change and whatever, and at break time he came up and he was telling me a story, and he said, I'm almost embarrassed to tell this story. He said, it was a while back, and he said, I went into a big box store, like a Walmart or whatever. And he said, I went after one item. He said, I, I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it. And he said, finally, I found the, the nearest um, person that worked there. It was a young man. And I said, young man, could you point me to where the typewriter paper is? Now, it was a slip of tongue, Okay. He used printer paper, but quite honestly, is there very much difference between typing paper and printer paper? You know? But here's the deal. He said, I felt so stupid. I felt shame for being old because the young man had said, nobody uses typewriter paper anymore. And here's this man feeling stupid because he asked for it. He was the CEO of his own business. And that business sold for several million dollars. But he was reduced to feeling old or out of date and ridiculous. This is what we do sometimes to one another. Okay. Write them down. What does that mean? 
in the shorthand lingo of acronyms and texting and whatever. If you don't know, just take a good guess. Don't, don't say them out loud. Write them down. Okay, anybody know all of them? An older adult told me, he said, it's like being in a foreign country where you don't know the language. You feel nervous and left out. It makes you want to give up. Hope this helps. Same stuff, different day. Parent alert. <laughs> Where's the party at? I always tell older dots, I said, y you need to play an intergenerational game where you do this with each other, you know, because the kids get a real hoot out of listening to what the things that the older adults will come up with uh, as far as what they think their answers are. Okay. I want you to pretend that you are in line for a big promotion, a huge promotion. And the person that's interviewing you is going to take you out to dinner. And they take you to a Portuguese restaurant. And the menu is in Portuguese. And you are going to order an appetizer. And you have no clue what any of these things are. But you don't want to admit that. And you don't, also don't want to order something you really don't like, and then you're going to be like, oh, gosh, i got to eat this. Pick one of these. Pick one of these. You got it? Let's see how you did. Well, you either got a snack of small beef pieces that are swimming in a light gravy of beer, or a small saucer of dried cured ham, or of sweet potatoes, or snails, or codfish, or sautéed strips of pork seasoned with garlic and white wine. But the thing is, if that would have been in real life, you would feel stress. You would feel stress, not wanting to make a wrong decision, being embarrassed about, you know, not knowing what you're supposed to order or what, what it means. So let's go back to Robin at the Gulf. Keeping in mind, this is what she said, everything I knew had vanished or changed so much that I didn't recognize it. It was the most surreal experience of my life. This is what our older adults are often feeling. For older loved ones, the overwhelming feeling of loss and change that accompanies old age can create a need to hang on tight to whatever they possibly can. For my mother... It was that remote. She wanted to be able to change that remote by herself. It may be easy for us to tell them to let it go. Right, let it go. It's not a big deal. Let go of the past. But for the older adult, it takes great courage. We're all, we want to, you know, we're all the time, in, which is good to encourage them to get into technology and whatever, but we're also very impatient at times when they don't pick up on it as fast as we think they should. Or it's like they don't want to try and we're not understanding why they might not want to try. Okay, so activity four. Make a list of at least 10 things that older adults are asked to let go of as they age. Okay?
If you're having a hard time, talk to your table mates. It's one of those things where you can help each other. Okay, I'm going to show you a list, and then I want you to add to that list, okay? Letting go, physical strength and stamina. They're asked to let go of relationships through death or through a move. Letting go of a home. Letting go of belongings, things that they've worked their entire lives to have. Letting go of independence. Letting go of the ability to drive. Letting go of an identity. Who I am I now that I am, I'm not a school teacher or that I'm not an engineer. Letting go of respect and authority. You may wonder, why didn't anybody call to ask me to serve on a board anymore? Letting go of routine. Things that you could call the day the way you wanted oftentimes changes and you're kind of at the mercy of other people's schedules. Letting go of dignity. Letting go of privacy. What else do you have to add? Holler. Letting, okay, letting go of going to church. There was one over here. Choosing what you're going to eat every day. Your money. Cleaning your house. Cooking. Taking care of grandbabies. What was fish fishing? Yeah, and hunting, things that you sporting things that you enjoyed doing. Earning money. Your opinion. I want you to keep thinking of these during the day, okay? Keep thinking of these during the day. All right, I want you to stand in the shoes of an older person and name at least 10 emotions that often come with unwanted changes. What are the things that they are feeling? Okay, again, because of time, we're going to kind of speed it on. See, I'm going to read through these, and then I want you to add to them. Fear, anger, bitterness, resentment, vulnerability, loss, grief, loneliness, depression, Sadness. What else? Frustration. Anxiety. What was it? 
burden becoming a burden, embarrassment, frustrating, helplessness, not trusting anyone, lonely, shame, suicidal thoughts. Do you see we could keep on and on? Inadequacy. It is important for family and caregivers to understand the magnitude of loss for older adults. Don't lose sight of this because this is what makes you a good caregiver. The more that you understand this and can empathize with this loss and these feelings that they are experiencing, the better caregiver you're going to be. I told you a little bit ago that I would share a little bit about this, how this all came to be. Um, Lucy Mary Ann Roberts was the mother of Robin Roberts of Good Morning America. Lucy Mary Ann had read my first book, um, Living with Purpose in a Worn Out Body. And I got a phone call at home one day. This when we still had landlines. And um, she called me at home. She said, I had to ask you one question. How did you know what was going on in my mind when you wrote that book? And for the next two years, Lucy Mary Ann became my cheerleader. My parents had both died by this time. And uh, we talked for a half an hour that first day. And we talked about that, we, we realized that we both had church pews in our homes. And mine came from a little antique store, and hers came from her church that had been ravaged during Hurricane Katrina and still had the water marks on it. And she wouldn't let them remove the marks. She said, no, we need to remember how this was. But Lucy Marianne would call me out of the blue, or she would send me a letter or a note always encouraging, always saying, she would end every conversation this with, she'd say, I love you now. Now you keep writing and speaking for old folks like me because we need you. Well, let me tell you, that when I'd be traveling and I'm tired and I'm in an airport and my flight's delayed or whatever, I could hear the voice of Lucy Mary Ann. Even though she died, in 2012, I can still hear that voice encouraging me because she took her role very seriously. Well, we were, um, I, I had asked her a question as we were working on her book. Long story short was Robin had always wanted her mom to write her memoir and Lucy Marion said, I'll do it, but if, only if Missy writes it for me. So in the summer of 2011, I spent the majority of that summer sitting across from Lucy Marianne and listening to her stories, capturing them on tape and then in, in print. And we became very good friends and still friends with the whole family. They've just been so supportive. But as we were working on her book, I asked her a question one day. I said, Lucy Marianne, what's the hardest thing about growing older? What's the hardest thing? And she did not miss a beat. I mean, she just answered that right off the bat. She said, to have two cars in the garage and not be able to drive either one. You see, she was very social. She loved to go and see and do and go out to eat and whatever. And she didn't want the family to sell those cars, even though she had neurological issues in which the doctor had said no more driving. So she loved it when I was there and I had a rental car because we could go all kind of places. Wherever she wanted to go, we would go. But for her, that was the hardest part about growing older. Keep in mind, she used a walker and a, power ch or, and a scooter. Okay? She had severe arthritis, had neurological issues. I mean, all kind of physical challenges. But it was that that was the hardest thing. That lack of being able to go and do on her own as she wanted to do. So now I want you to think about your own aging. And I want you to write at least five things you dread most or fear about growing older.
Okay, I'm going to go through a list, and then I want you to add to that. Here we go. Physical decline. And some of these overlap, obviously. Dementia. Outliving finances. Loss of independence. Grandchildren's future. Downsizing, for those of you that are maybe boomers or even younger. The whole idea for my, my mother was like emotionally paralyzed at the thought of downsizing. She was ready to move into senior care, but the thought of what do I do with all this stuff just overwhelmed her. Loss of loved ones, and I don't mean just spouses. Spouses, that's huge, but it's also friends. Being alone, caring for aging parents, not being able to drive, health cost, becoming a burden, being forgotten. And then there was a woman that once told me, she said, I fear becoming the person that even the caregivers dread to help. That's real. Tell me what you have to add to that list. Eyesight, loss of eyesight, loss of hearing and dry, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Making decisions, not being able to go to the bathroom by yourself. Somebody had something over here. Helping my kids. If we're honest with ourselves, and I think the farther we go on the timeline of life, these things are in our, are in our minds. And it doesn't matter if I'm talking to boomers, maybe even late boomers that are, are more like in their 50s or whatever, all the way through 90s and 100, these are the same issues. It doesn't matter if I'm here or if I'm in South Africa, I get the same responses. Most older adults are not afraid of death, not that moment of death. It's the in-between times that concerns them the most. It's the how is life going to unfold from where I am right now until the moment of death. Am I going to linger in a state of pain? What if I hear that I have dementia? Where will I go? How will I pay for it? Keep that in mind as you're dealing with older adults. Culture strongly influences the way we see aging. This is nothing new, but we need to be reminded. Traditionally, in Western societies like the United States, the elderly have been viewed as irrelevant and a financial drain on society. Growing old in the 21st century is a challenge and entails high risk, especially for the old old and the oldest old. Thus, aging successfully depends to a large extent, notice this, on coping effectively with age-related life events. When I'm speaking to older adults themselves, I have a whole series of things that I talk about joyfully adapting. That that needs to be our key phrase, joyfully adapting. Not happily, not happily, because there are going to be things that come along that we're not happy about. But joyfully adapting. Culture tells us that aging is an enemy, something that we must battle daily. $292 billion spent on anti-aging products and services. This was 2014, by the way. Imagine what it is now. Older adults are also aging in a world that is obsessed with youth. Do you even know all those people? It tells us something, doesn't it? That's blue ivy over in the left-hand corner in case, yeah. We are bombarded daily with images via magazines, billboards, television, and the internet. It's all about the look and the image, not about the experience and the wisdom behind the eyes. 
I was speaking at a church that was organizing their new older adult group, and they were trying to come up with a name. And they had all kind of acronyms, and they went with a kind of a familiar acronym in that they wanted SAGE. But different groups have different meanings for that. And so I asked them, I said, so what does that stand for? Seniors Against Getting Elderly. We stopped at that point and regrouped. I said, let's think about what does that say to that person in the wheelchair? You're against them? You're, I mean, I'm all for doing what we need to do to stay active as long as we can and whatever, but we got to be really careful in what we're saying. Anti-aging, against aging, just, just think of all the products. If you go just down the, the aisle at CVS or Walgreens or you know, Walmart, whatever, and just look at all the anti-aging products or on your television for sure. And we live in a disposable world. We just throw things out. The idea of tossing out the old has seeped into the way that we think about aging. And this has even happened in our churches, sadly. So I'm wondering what has shaped your perception on aging over the years. And think about how culture has impacted your view of aging. And I'll explain why this is important. Perceptions of aging develop over the course of one's life, influenced by personal experiences and cultural representations of aging. Okay, that makes sense. The media is part of the cultural messages that inform how we feel about ourselves as aging people. Hmm. Often older adults are depicted as out of touch, cognitively impaired, the kind of goofy, I don't know what's going on persona. Or sometimes it'll be the grumpy, you know, you get the, like, the whole grumpy thing going on. Conversely, seniors might be idealized as symbols of hyperphysical successful aging, as in, I'm 90 and I can jump out of an airplane. So we kind of have these two extremes going on. Either you're, you know, out of it or grumpy, or you're the, you're the woman that can do gymnastics at the age of 90 or the person jumping out of the airplane. And that sure leaves a whole bunch of people right in the middle. So don't compare. Let me explain this story. I was at a, an assisted living community, and as I was leaving, there was a man probably in his late 50s, I'm going to guess, and he was walking with his mother. His mother was on a walker. She had, her ankles were swollen. I mean, they were just enormous. She grimaced with every step. Now, I don't know this, but I have a feeling they were late to the doctor because the whole time, he starts off beside her, and then he gets in front of her. He's going, hurry up, Mom. Hurry up, Mom. Hurry up, Mom. And I'm looking at this woman's face, and my heart's just breaking because I really wanted to go pinch his head. But, you know, I couldn't do that. He goes in front. He gets to the car door. He opens the car door. He's standing just so impatiently, waiting for her to come. Probably did not allow enough time to get mom safely from her apartment to the car to the doctor's office, and so therefore he's hurrying her up. Hurry up, mom, hurry up. And then he looks at her and he says, why can't you be more like Betty White? I hear things like this. I hear things like this, and it breaks my heart. So I'll often, you know, just I'll, I'll caution you, to just be careful in your own mind and in your own world, not, not to compare one older adult to another. Because everybody, just as we heard this morning, everybody's got a different story. We can be inspired. Betty White, I think, inspired us. Queen Elizabeth inspired us. You know, but that's not going to be everybody's story. And we need to keep that in mind. People's ideas about older adults are often negatively shaped by things like standing behind elderly persons in line who are slow and hold up other people or slow drivers. You know, we just get so irritated. Or unwillingly interacting with an aging relative who is in physical, mental decline. 
Anybody read A Christmas Tea? The story of Christmas? Okay, I'll tell you that later. Um, watching commercials, movies, and videos that stereotype older adults. So I'm wondering, why is it important for you to explore your own perceptions of aging? For people who work in senior care, there is a connection between their perceptions of aging and the way they interact with seniors. Ooh. There's a connection. If a caregiver has a more positive view of aging, even with its challenges, the more likely the caregiver is to encourage greater independence, self-direction, and well-being among older adults. Did you know that? That is quite a responsibility. When you think about it, your perception on aging has a lot to do with how you are going to interact and encourage an older person. We also need to remember that in times of rapid change, older adults may show signs of resistance or unreasonableness, but it's important to see the underlying reason. Green glass. After my father died, my brother and sister, who live in Austin, insisted on coming up and staying with my mom so that my husband and I could get away. And so we're in Hawaii, we're on a beach, I had left all kinds of instructions because I, I was the daily, I was the, the kiddo that was there closest to my parents, um, you know, like they lived to, my brother and sister lived 200 miles away, so it was obvious, but we, we had a great relationship. We have a great relationship. Anyway, I left them all these different instructions, you know, which pills need to be cut, all this kind of stuff. So I'm sitting on a beach and I get a phone call from my brother. He said, Missy, I don't know what's going on, but something's happening with mom. It was another one of those times that she was prickly, I will say. Okay? She was prickly, and that was not her style. So immediately, you know, the, the antenna go up because there's something that's causing that. And he said, I can't figure out, you know, what's, what's going on, and she's not able to really articulate it and whatever, but something's not right. So we kind of are going through the day and what had happened. And I said, John, you know that, that powdered medicine um, that we stir it up and, and leave on Mother's Night stand in the afternoon uh, for her to drink? And, she, and he said, yes. I said, what glass did you put that in? He said, well, I don't know. I think it was a, one that had flowers on it or whatever. And it dawned on me. I always put it in a green plastic glass for no reason other than if she knocked it off, it wouldn't break. I had neglected to tell him that. He just took a glass, stirred it up, put it on her night table. It was up to her to drink it then when she was ready. She could not articulate the fact that this something was wrong. I don't even know that she knew it. But what it did is it signaled it was something out of her routine. It totally threw her for a loop. By this time, she's probably, she's probably in about 92. And, and it just threw her for a loop. We had to stop and think about what was it? What, you know, what would have caused this and whatever? So we need to keep that in mind. When somebody gets prickly, that who's usually not a prickly person, figure out why. Because so often there are reasons, there are underlying reasons that if once we understand, see, for my mom, that was a, a bit of independence. She could drink it any time that afternoon she wanted. But it needed to be in that green plastic glass. So I want you to tell about, and we won't have a whole lot of time this, but tell it within your table. Tell about an example from your own life when an older adult was defensive or agitated, but you discovered the underlying reason. And then it caused you to have more empathy. If you have an experience like that, share that with your table group.
Uh, in a minute, I do. I, yeah, I want to have a representative. Tell it to, for now, tell it to your group, but then I do want to hear what some of them are, okay? Okay, I'd like to hear one from each table. So one person from each table, I don't care who, but stand up and turn around and speak very loudly so the whole group can hear, okay? Let's start with this table. Okay. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay, this table. One of you, let's go. St stand up and turn around so they can hear you. Thank you. 
Good one. Somebody here? The loudest voice. <laughs> You're in the spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, here. Stand up. <laughs> That's great. That is joyfully adapting, I do believe, don't you? I, At this table. When my mom is uh, late stage of Alzheimer's and a hoarder, and so when she sees me, she says, I'm telling you, you're a jerk, you're not the house you're filled with, but you won't be a jerk. So at least last night, it took care of it. But I'm sitting stuck in her house, and I'm seeing the art stuff piles, and she's putting all these boxes together and the cabinet, and um, she's getting really, really upset over it. And I know that's good for me to get upset. But 
and she looked at me finally yesterday and she said, just stop this. Why are you putting everything where you want it? This isn't your house, this is my house. <laughs> <laughs> Real life. Here we go. This table. Mm-hmm. Yeah. True. This table? <laughs> Can you speak up a little bit? Good job, yeah. Middle table? (laughs) Okay. Thank you. That table? Mm-hmm. Sure. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You have one? Can you speak up just a little bit?
A. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good stories. And you learn from each other. You know. So some physical challenges, uh, or changes rather. These are one, these you know, and there would be so many more. Stamina, strength, and suppleness start to decline. Hearing and vision loss. Skin loses elasticity. Difficulties with fine motor skills that control coordination and dexterity. Also gross motor skills and increasing arthritis. Blood pressure, hardening of the arteries. There are many more that we could go over as well. Emotional changes, okay? Dealing with end-of-life thoughts. And I'm not t talking necessarily about suicide here. I'm just talking about things about their impending death. You know, how is life going to unfold between where I am now and that moment of death? Um, struggling with the loss of purpose. And we're going to talk about that in another session, but that's huge. Feeling of regret over unfulfilled dreams or broken family relationships. I was sitting with a, a woman in, uh, who was like 89, I believe. It's a friend's mother. The, my friend and her sister do not get along. And as I'm sitting with the mother who is dying, she, there were tears just rolling down her face. And I put my hand on hers and I said, Jewel, what's, what's going on? And she could barely get the words out. But she said, I don't want to die with my two girls just constantly arguing with each other. She said, I haven't been a good mother, I guess. And she died the next day. And the two girls still don't get along. You know, that, that's big. Grief. You know, over loved ones, grieving the home, grieving loss of belongings, enduring chronic pain, big emotional changes, spiritual changes, unable to be physically active in church activities. For those that have, that's been their life to not be able to be able to be a part of that on a, you know, on a regular basis is really big. Less able to concentrate on long passages or text or scripture. I found this with my mother. Uh, it was one reason I started writing, and all my devotions are brief. They're not long. I try to pack a lot of message into a short, short amount of text because it was hard for her as she aged to really concentrate on long passages. Their faith community shrinks as friends die or move away. If you've been in an older adult Sunday school class, say the oldest old Sunday school class in your church, and if it's like one in my church, there were seats where no one would sit because that's where Earl always sat, and that's where Ed always sat, and that's where Yvonne sat. And so they, you know, they still kind of honor those as one by one. They're dying. Fewer opportunities to be spiritually nourished as independence slips away, more isolated. Lack of attention from church, le church leaders and church family. This is a sad reality, and it's why I do what I do. So we're back to George Clooney. <laughs> yep, even George is growing old. The journey of aging, even though he does have what, tw twins? Are they twins or twins, right? And I, they're what, maybe five, six years old now? Something like that? Same thing, though. The journey of aging, it's, it's real for all of us. Okay, let's, let's stop, and we're going to have a 15-minute break, I believe, and be back at 10.15. Okay.
Sometimes life can seem overwhelming, out of control, even hopeless. Springwood's Behavioral Health is here to help you. Come home to Mercy Crest, where you know your loved one is being provided excellent care with compassion. Mercy Crest provides hospitality. worked hard all your life. You deserve to relax and enjoy yourself and at Legacy Heights Retirement You've worked hard all your life. You deserve a center. We offer all those things and more. Our independent living facility allows you to come and go as you please with several activity options tailored by you. And the best part, it's all inclusive and secure. Our friendly staff takes care of your cleaning and laundry needs while you enjoy three delicious meals a day. Come home to Legacy Heights Retirement Center, 1012 Fayetteville Road in Van Buren. You've worked hard all your life. You deserve to relax and enjoy yourself. And at Legacy Heights Retirement Center, we offer all those things and more. Our independent living facility allows you to come and go as you please with several activity options tailored by you. And the best part, it's all inclusive and secure. Our friendly staff takes care of your cleaning and laundry needs while you enjoy three delicious meals a day. Come home to Legacy Heights Retirement Center, 1012 Fayetteville Road in Van Buren. You've worked hard all your life. You deserve to...
Okay, I have 10, uh-oh, well, I just lost my battery pack. Hang on, hang on. Let's try that again. That's what I get for going to the bathroom. I had to get all unhooked. Okay, are we good? All right, session two. Worry. Uh-oh, it would help if I would get my thing on, wouldn't it? I tell you, if you've ever done live television, you have a whole new appreciation for the anchors and all the things they have to go through with all their apparatus. All right. Worry, grief, depression. All a part of the, or to some degree, of the journey of aging. Uh -oh. I don't want to go into big clinical stuff because I think y'all probably have had that already, but I, I want to hit upon these because I think it's so important that caregivers be aware because you're kind of the first line of defense in many situations. So worry and anxiety, that vague uneasy feeling or discomfort or dread accompanied by an automatic response, a feeling of apprehension caused by anticipation of danger or concern. Remember when I had you do this earlier? What are the fears? What are the things if you wake up in the middle of the night that you're thinking about? Our worries, they're natural. They're natural, but they can also get out of control. Grief, that natural sadness or sorrow following the loss of a loved person or thing. Please do not overlook the fact that people grieve things they grieve the loss of those things from their home. I remember being with a, an older adult woman once, and she was, she was so sad watching her things be sold in a, an estate sale. She said, I know it needs to be done. She said, but do you see that lamp? Do you know how many green stamps it took me to get that lamp? I mean, it meant something to her. And so we lose sight of that. You know, for us, it's just an... Uh, you know, an ugly lamp. But to her, that was something else. Symptoms include fatigue, depressed mood, insomnia, anorexia, feeling of regret or guilt, or a variety of physical discomforts. Depression. This goes to a whole other level. A disorder of the brain. Okay? Okay. That, some well, that has some well-defined signs and symptoms that, <clears throat> that last for an extended time, two weeks, a month, or longer. And there's actual change in the brain chemicals. Interesting to note. Oh, no. Okay, the symptoms of depression. Sadness or continually feeling down. Tiredness and constant low energy. Trouble focusing or making decisions. Anger, irritability, or frustration. Loss of interest in activities once enjoyed. Trouble sleeping or sleeping too much. Feeling isolated, removed from social activities. Overeating, undereating, or craving unhealthy food. Suicidal thoughts. Frequent headaches, stomach aches, muscle pain. Drug or alcohol abuse. And this is getting to be more and more of a problem. I want you to think for a moment about how you felt on the first day of school in a new place. How did you feel on the first day of school in a new town, if you've ever experienced that? Anybody? Now I want you to imagine an older adult trying to find their way around an unfamiliar senior living community. 
more so than the geography of the place, okay, it's this, the unwritten rules. The unwritten rules. Where will I sit? Will they like me? What if no one wants to be my friend? Do not think that we ever outgrow that need. There are 90-year-olds that are feeling that apprehension just as much as that five-year-old boy. So even if it's a necessary and wanted move, there's still an amount of that that they're going to go through. And we need to be aware of that. Life in the old age often seems strange, unfamiliar, and uncertain. Maybe a new widow is trying to adjust to life after the death of a longtime spouse. Okay? Taking on new responsibilities. I have a friend who recently lost her husband, and she said it was trying to figure out how to put a filter in the air conditioning system. And she said, I just broke down and sobbed. She'd never done that before, and it just brought up all kind of emotions. Making hard decisions alone. Do I go? Do I stay? Do I move nearer my son or my daughter? I had one older friend that she lived in, in Rockwall, where I'm from, outside of Dallas, and she was going to move to be closer to one of her two sons. One son lived in Tyler in East Texas. The other son lived in Abilene in West Texas. And I was fully expecting her to say Tyler because there were pine trees and it was just, you know, prettier, quite frankly. And she said, no, I'm going to Abilene. And I said, oh, what helped you make that decision? She said, I chose the daughter-in-law I like the best. <laughs> that was some wisdom in there. Lack of companionship. I remember my mother saying that after my father died, she said, each night I just roll over and pat the pillow and talk to him. If you've been together for 60, 70 years, even 40 years, 30 years, it's a long time just to have that daily companionship. Perhaps she was the caregiver for him, and now, now what? What do I do with my day? Where am I needed? What am I going to do? Everything's turned upside down. Maybe they are dealing with a health crisis and trying to navigate an unfamiliar medical complex. Maybe they're going to MD Anderson in Houston. Maybe they're going to one of our large complexes in Dallas. And they're trying to navigate the traffic, the highways that are unfamiliar. And if you've driven in the Dallas area lately, you know, I mean, there it is just crazy. It's like, I don't know if COVID just baked people's brains or whatever, but everybody seems to be so much more aggressive these days, truly. Parking, pain, the QR codes, and I'm supposed to do this on my phone. I've never done it before. I'm trying to park in a place I've never been before. It all adds up, and it's overwhelming. The stress of test and waiting and filling out the paperwork. All of these things add to the stress. Maybe they're making a move to a new city, leaving behind longtime neighbors, friends, church, doctors, drugstore, everything that's familiar, and suddenly... They're in a brand new place. And maybe the only people that they know there are is family who really aren't there a lot. They're not there to help them daily navigate where things are. Maybe they're grieving the fact that they cannot do the things they once loved to do. They once loved to travel, go to, you know, go on that two-week cruise, go to Europe, do whatever, and they're no longer able to do. Maybe it was fishing. Maybe it was hiking. And now they find themselves in a situation where they cannot do those things. 
It's not surprising that old age can be a wilderness experience. And that phrase came to me from my father, who said one day, he died at the age of 87, and one day I remember him saying, he said, you know, growing old, it's like being in the wilderness. It's like being in a dry wilderness. And I never forgot that. And he, he and my mother were both so proactive in making decisions. I mean, they, were, they did it all right. But still, he felt that. Many older adults feel lost and lonely and vulnerable. And families are struggling to figure out how to help. Back to Lucy Mary Ann. She was telling me one day that she, she had a caregiver that would come to her home. The caregiver was driving her to go to a medical appointment. It was a, not a huge complex, but it was a multi-storied thing. And to save time, because they had errands they needed to run, they decided that the caregiver would let her off the door in her power chair, and then she would run the errands and come back and pick her up. They had it all worked out. Well, caregiver drives off. Lucy Marianne is in her power chair, scooter, I'm sorry, it's electric scooter, and headed down the long corridor when her electric scooter died because they'd forgotten to charge it. And she said, here she is in this complex sitting on her electric scooter and people all, you know, just hurrying by, going places. And she said, I kept thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And she said, I felt so old and stupid and vulnerable. And you had to know Lucy Marianne because she was a, a get-it-done kind of gal. And vulnerability was not her game. But in this instant, she had no control. She said, she said, I could not have gotten up and walked the distance and whatever. I said, what did you do? She said, well, I finally found someone that was going by. I said, excuse me, could you roll me to a plug? Which they did. And she got charged up enough that she could get to her appointment. Not only are older adults coping with the decline in death of family members and close friends, they themselves are probably experiencing a variety of living losses, living losses associated with changes in identity, status, relationship, lifestyle, independence, and energy. Living losses. I'm a person of faith, and so I can't look at aging without looking at it through the eyes of faith. And so let me read from... This is my newest book, From Dry Bones to Living Hope. It's based on, on that, what my father had said about aging or growing older for him was like being in the wilderness. And so I chose Ezekiel's vision. Whoops, sorry. Uh, as the theme. So let me just read a little bit of it. There are days when Ezekiel's vision is my reality. A scorched valley stretches out before me as far as my eyes can see. It is a field littered with the remains of once vibrant lives. There is no sign of life, only dry bones, very dry bones. Everywhere I turn, there are worn out bodies like mine. Frames beaten down by time, minds bleached out by the years. In this season of life, my hope has shriveled into nothingness. How long must I linger in this harsh environment, O oh Lord, without purpose and a reason to live? I am spiritually dead. I am nothing more than a heap of dry bones. But then from the hush of the desert, I hear a voice. Can these bones live? Lord, you alone know. Prophesy, speak to the bones. So I speak of God's greatness over the ruins. The bones begin to rattle and come together with sinew and flesh. But still there is no life. Prophesy, speak to the spirit. I speak and breath begins to fill the lifeless bodies. 
breath, wind, spirit. The one who hovered over earth's creation now blows new life into my declining body. O Lord, where there is deadness, you bring new life and hope. Where there is a dead end, you reveal a way out of the wilderness. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Fill me anew and let these old bones dance for you once again. God invites us to lament. And as caregivers, you can have a huge influence over helping older adults know that God has given them an okay to lament. Laments are those heartfelt prayers that express suffering and loss, just like what I read. But don't confuse laments with grumblings. For people of faith, a lament is that whole deep holy expression of loss in faith. Grumbling is when you complain about the raisin in your oatmeal cookie. You see the difference. You've experienced the difference. If you've been with older adults, you've experienced this difference. There are some who just grumble. And there are others who need to lament because they're carrying a deep, deep burden, a deep loss. Gone are the days when. Gone are the days when I could drive. Gone are the days when I could hold the hand of my spouse. Gone are the days when I could cook Thanksgiving dinner for the family. Gone are the days when I could walk outside unaided without concern of falling. Not too long before my father died, I was over visiting one day and um, and you had to know him. He was a six foot six Texan in the best sense of the word. And he was a can do it, fix it kind of guy. You know them, independent, you know, able, able to fix anything. But on this given day, he said, I need your help. And I said, Well, sure, what do you need? He said, See, the, I need to change the light bulb in the ceiling fan. Now, keep in mind that they lived in a senior community, and he could have called the handyman, okay? But he also knew that might take a day or two, and he wanted it done then. And I was there, and I said, sure, I'll do that for you. He had a small stepladder. Number one, I applaud him for not trying to do it himself. But he knew that he did not have the energy to reach over his head, unscrew the uh, bulb, the, what am I call it? cover thing, yeah, get the light bulb out, replace it, and then put the, the cover back up. He just didn't have it. And so I did, and whatever, and he's standing there and watching. And I remember saying to him, Dad, I know that could not have been easy for you to ask me, but thank you for doing that. Because you see, he, he felt his independence slipping away. Here he is, the guy on the right-hand side in the parade and back also in World War II. And not only was it his independence slipping away, it was his self-esteem. To, to have to ask a daughter to do something that he could have done so easily just a few years prior. And that was a matter of grace, I think, for him to even be able to ask that instead of getting upset or whatever. For him to be able to ask that. So I want you to think of older adults in your circle of influence. That could be, you know, whether they're professional, whether they're clients that you deal with, whether it's family members, whether it's people from church or neighbors. But I want you to write down the name, five names of older adults. Just jot them down.
Beside each one of those names, I want you to finish the statement for them as if they would finish it. Gone are the days when. Finish it like you think they would finish it. Okay, let's hear from each table, at least one person from each table. We'll start at the back this time. Let's start back over there. Making her so gone are the days when I had someone to make a, a decision with. Yeah. So gone are the days when I'm going to have a, someone to walk through life with me, right? Okay. How about the back table? So gone are the days when you're physically able to crawl under houses or on top of them and do manual labor. Yeah. Back middle. Gone are the days when we came together, when it was an intentional coming together. Okay. This group. When work on your own vehicles. Gone are the days when you could work on your own vehicles. Because so much of it's computerized and whatever now, it's like foreign. Yeah, envision. Okay. And I bet he misses that. Yeah. This table? So gone are the days when I could come and go as I wanted to. They had the freedom to do that and the ability to do that. This table? Uh, yeah. Okay, could hunt. And that probably was a part, big part of his life, right? Yeah. Gone are the days when I could dance. And do you hear how it's different than for someone who 
that activity might temporarily be on hold. Like, you know, like I, I was telling somebody earlier or whatever, I fractured my, my heel a few years ago. And um, I was in a wheelchair for three months, no, absolutely no weight bearing or whatever. And so, you know, but I knew that I was coming back. You know, I knew that I would get to the other side of that. It's different than when you're going, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to be able to go dancing again. Okay. Okay. We did y'all, didn't we? Okay. This group in front. When sex was a double. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> okay. Driving, going to the days when I could drive. When I, that was Lucy Marianne, wasn't it? Having those two cars. And she would, that was the cutest thing because she did not want to sell them. They did not sell them as long as she was alive because I think she liked to at least go look at them or something, you know. Here we go. Mowed down yard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, she found, I guess that's joyfully adapting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's cute. Did I miss any tables? Okay. Whoops. So why is lamenting? important to older adults. And this is why I want you to know it so that you can help older adults lament. And let me explain what I'm talking about. It may seem counterintuitive as if you are promoting a negative mindset because it seems like you're saying, oh, that's negative. What can I no longer do? You know, gone are the days when. But naming specific laments is actually a healthy spiritual practice that will help older adults move through difficult life transitions. So often, in my experience with older adults, is they want someone to acknowledge, this is hard. This is hard. They want their children to know that. I had a lady, this has been, oh, probably 10 years ago. Uh, my second book, Talking with God in Old Age, had just come out. And she, she came in, it was at a book signing, and she bought like 12 copies or something and, and all this and a, I'm like, oh, my, you know, who are you buying all these for? And she said, she said, well, some of them are for my children. And I thought, well, won't that be interesting? They're going to be delighted to have this, I'm sure. She said, no. She said, I keep trying to tell them that growing old is hard. She said, they don't understand, and they won't listen to me. I'm hoping they'll listen to you. That is a frustration of a lot of older adults feeling like, Oh, you're just wearing rose, you know, it, it's going to be fine. It's, it's all good. It's all about attitude. And there is some of that. Of course, it's about attitude, but it's not all about attitude. And so sometimes they just want to know that you understand this is hard. This is hard. Instead of bottling up negative emotions, laments, Direct the pain to God. Hear that. They're directing the pain to God, not lashing out at other people. When you lament, you're crying out to God, and God can take it. And it's different than when you're taking it out on a caregiver or a family member. Laments are a biblical model for talking to God when the pain is strong featuring phrases that express sorrow and reaffirm hope. And they always will have hope. If you, if you followed that dry bones story, it comes and there's hope at the end. But not before we have to go through that pit, that wilderness. So how might you encourage an older adult to lament? You can direct them to laments that are in the Bible. 
if they are people of faith. And if you're not sure where they are, just Google laments in the Bible and they'll pop up. There's a whole book of lamentations. There are many laments in the book of Psalms. Share devotions that are laments. Here's one right out of my um, talking with God in old age that I was just telling you about. This one's about pain. Every day I wake up to pain. Even before my, I open my eyes, I hunker down, ready to do battle. By mid-morning, the agony creeps through my body until it reaches my soul. Medication helps, but eventually it grinds me down. Now and then, it seems the pain will never end. In this anguish, I wonder if you've forgotten me. How long will it go on, Lord? This is no way to live, no way to die. You have seen the grimace on my face, God. You have heard my moans. Come near, comfort me. Don't let this searing pain rob me of joy. Have mercy on these brittle old bones. Or this one about dignity. I never wanted to be like this, dependent on others for the most intimate parts of daily life. Caregivers now do for me what I cannot do for myself. At times, it is so awkward and embarrassing. I feel exposed. Where is the dignity in this? Is there no choice but to grin and bear it? Perhaps I have no choice except in how I choose to receive a caregiver's help. When I am self-conscious, remind me that I am made in your image, God. When I feel shame, tell me once again that I am precious to you. Turn my humiliation to gratitude. Enfold me this day in a warm blanket of hope and compassion and grant me dignity. Invite them to talk about those feelings. There was a, a adult child, a daughter, who sent me a note some years ago and whatever, and she had a picture of this book, and it was all earmarked and on her mother's nightstand. And her mother had passed away. And she said, I'm telling you, she read that over and over and over because it was expressing what she was feeling over and over. Listen to gospel music. I mean, the gospel music's full of laments or the blues. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me home. Help me stand. I'm tired. I'm weak. I am worn. Invite them to lament the purpose is not to stay in that lament, but that the lament will move us through. It is, it is that crying out to God, and then we will move through that. Encourage them to name their laments and remind them that God, and this is, this is key because so many people think, um, particularly, I, I've known a lot of very faithful older adults who do the smile and everything's okay. Because they think if they were to cry out to God, that they're gonna, it's like a sin. I'm like, no. No, God is calling us to do that. And we talk about that, you know. They're, they have to give themselves permission to know it's okay. God is calling us to do that. Understand that as research shows, older adults grieve differently than young people. The longer we live, the more losses we will experience. The two emotions that are most detrimental to our well-being are grief and loneliness, both which can contribute to the further declines in health and quality of life. I bet you've experienced this with older adults that you've cared for. The death of a loved one can cause a devastating impact on the immune system and, uh, of a surviving older adult. How many of you know of someone that the spouse died and not long after the, the other spouse died? Yes? Raise your hand. Yeah. 
Research indicates that a compromised immune system is a leading cause for older people dying shortly after their spouse. So in what ways do older adults grieve differently than the younger generation? It's all about the compounded loss. The bereavement overload, some call it. Or as I call it, loss upon loss. Do you see those waves? Whew. Loss of home. Loss of spouse. Loss of the ability to drive. They're compounded one after another after another. And that's different for older adults than it is for a younger person who can still drive, who can still have control of their life. Also because of physical decline and less energy, many older adults feel that they have little ability to deal with the compounding losses, unlike their younger counterparts. So just simply not having as much energy affects how they're going to handle those constantly being hit by one more loss. So let me tell you the story of John. John was my friend for at least two decades. He lived where my parents lived. And when I first met John, he had moved there because his wife had recently died. And I want you to notice that painting because we're going to come back to it in just a second. Here's a picture of John. His wife died unexpectedly, and he was in deep, deep grief. He was grieving many of the unrealized dreams that they had had. They were going to travel during their golden years. They had all these, they'd done some traveling, but they had big trips all lined up. They had cruises planned. They had so many things they were going to do while they were still active and able to do it. And then suddenly, she's gone and he's by himself. Her death then caused stress with him, for him. He had a stroke. He lost mobility in one side of his body. He moved to long ter a long-term rehab while he overcame. He was in that for six months, trying to get back the ability to walk, to speak, all those things. Do you hear the loss upon loss upon loss? He was grieving the loss of his home because when he had the stroke, he moved from home, first to hospital, then to rehab, couldn't go back home, they said, so he had to go to senior living. So all these things are happening. All these things are happening. But I want to explain how three people made such an impact with small things that it changed the trajectory of where he was headed to, which I think was into deep depression. One friend lived overseas and could not come back for the service for his wife. And so he, he was all over technology. He, you know, he emailed, he could search the internet and whatever. He emailed back and forth with their friend who lived in England at the time. She felt badly that she couldn't be there. And she said, John, I want you to do one thing for me. Every day, at the end of the day, I want you to email me three blessings that you experienced that day. Okay. At first, he was mad because he didn't want to do it. And as he said, there wasn't anything to be happy about. There, wasn't, there weren't any blessings. He was very resistant to it. But she was his friend. And he felt accountable to her. He said it took him a while. He would just send something blank. And he said, I can't think of anything today. Can't think of anything today. Can't think of anything today. Finally, there was a day when he woke up and he turned the coffee on. He said there was something about the aroma of the coffee that caught his attention. He went, well, that's one. So at the end of that day, he wrote her one thing. But as you're going to guess, those things continued because he felt accountable to her and he continued that. That was one of the things that was going on. When he was in rehab, his therapist 
talked to him and they talked about art because he loved, oh, he loved art museums, he loved art. She picked up on that. And so she decided that was going to be one way that he could practice small motor skills. So she bought him art supplies and whatever. And this is cool what he did. His first painting was of his wheelchair in the corner because he was celebrating the fact that he had moved out of the wheelchair and onto a walker. So he was painting his progression. He was painting his own celebration. Two things, okay? The friend oversees the therapist. A fellow resident, once he moved back into senior care, or moved to senior care, knew that John was very smart. He was very engaged. He was an engineer. Like I said, he loved to be on the internet, loved to search for things. That friend asked him, would you do a current events class for us? So John took it upon himself with that encouragement that he had a weekly current events class, and he would review news of the day, some that was out there, but a lot of things that were kind of fun, you know, weird kind of news and whatever, and they had a great time. They were all looking to John to do the research and to bring it. Three things that might seem insignificant, but they totally changed how he was looking at life. He began to paint pictures from pictures that he had. And one of the first ones he did once he got to his senior apartment was to paint a picture of his wife. The one of the ways, he painted that from a picture of when they had gone to Maine. He was working through his grief by remembering and reminiscing Still sad that they weren't going to be able to go on those trips that they had planned. But he was celebrating the things that they had done together. Plan B, as they call it. And then the friend that had asked him to do the current events class. Three things. You just don't know what power that you hold as a caregiver to help someone turn that corner in their grief. And to, to give them a tool in which it will help them to get out of. So, three things. The encouragement to write three blessings. The art supplies. And someone to plant the seed about a new purpose for his life. Now, I want to compare that to a study that was done from the mental health and family medicine. Because this person's not so different than John. It was a 73-year-old man widowed after his wife experienced a short battle with advanced cancer. They had a loving relationship over 50 years. He had been their main, her main caregiver, had accompanied her for every medical appointment. He felt tremendous guilt about his wife's death, that he, he kept thinking he should have been able to do more. He began to experience sleeping difficulty and poor appetite. And based on what her father had told her, his daughter thought that her father was doing fairly well. So she was not, she was there, but not really there. She was not picking up on the things that were happening. He began to visit his wife's grave three or four times daily. Daily. His mood was extremely low. Sometimes drove his car without knowing where he was headed. Poor eye contact with others and unkept appearance. Didn't want to burden his daughter with his feelings, so he kept that in from her. Diagnosed finally with major depression, received counseling, antidepressants, and then made the family much more aware. But their two stories are almost parallel in terms of what happened to them. So don't ever underestimate your ability to step in and also to recognize when it's moved from grief, loneliness, into depression. Most bereaved people are able to overcome their grief, but in 10% of the cases, grief becomes prolonged or complicated 
With prolonged grief, a sense of helplessness will likely develop. The factors to consider, you know, do, when do you say something um, about counseling, medical support, things like the nature of the loved one's death, was it unexpected, was it traumatic in some way? Uh, what kind of social support did they have? He didn't really have friends. John had friends. The second gentleman was pretty isolated, where his daughter would drop in but out and wasn't really involved in his daily life. And then abnormal reactions to death, being substance abuse, too, too frequent visits to the cemetery, etc. Things that are not helpful to say to an older adult who's in grief. And this generally applies to anyone who's grieving. They're in a better place. We mean well when we say it, but if you're the recipient of that, they may be in a better place, but I want them here with me. Or at least they're not in any pain now. Well, that may be true, but I'd still rather them be here with me. Or I understand how you feel. Oh, really? Just because you lost your spouse, you don't know exactly how I feel. God needed another angel. I'm not even going to get into the theology of that, but trust me, it's not a good place to go. Or at least you had each other for a long time. And again, maybe that may be true, but I still want them here with me. So what do we say? I say keep it simple. Keep it simple and heartfelt. I wish I had the right words to say. I am just so very sorry. Saying that does not try to say to them, I know how you feel, when I really don't know exactly how you feel or what you're experiencing. It Just keep it simple. I wish I had the right words. Or if you can't even think of that, just a hug. A hug. One of the greatest threats to an older adult's overall well-being is a, uh, losing a sense of purpose. I cannot tell you how important this is. Okay, keep in mind that was one of the things that was key for John, okay? To have that sense of purpose. Not only did he pick up art and begin to express himself in that, it was also when the, um, the in that last one when they asked him to do a current events class and suddenly someone else was looking to him to do something to help others. There's a data-driven link between having a sense of meaning and supporting positive physical, mental, and cognitive functioning. Or if we put that in simple words, having a purpose in life leads to better physical and mental health. It's that simple. We never outgrow our need to have a purpose. And I'm talking about even if that person is in a wheelchair, they still need to have a sense of purpose. The greater one sense of purpose, the greater the benefits to their overall well-being. And again, this is where you're going to come in and that there are going to be things where or ways that you can direct them to purpose. So if someone has a purpose, they're going to have stronger personal relationships, broader social engagements, less loneliness, better mental health, less chronic pain, less disability, healthier lifestyles, less time spent alone in watching TV. Caregivers and family are vital to helping older adults rediscover a sense of purpose when it feels like they have little or none. How many of you know an older adult who is struggling with the idea of having purpose? Who's like, their, their response would be, how you doing? I'm just here. Do you hear that often? That was actually the phrase that got me started writing because I would hear that where my parents lived. One older adult would ask another, how are you doing today? I'm just here. Do you hear how that has no sense of purpose? But remember that having purpose is not the same thing as keeping busy. Okay, listen to this. 
There are many things that we can do, and if it's at a senior living community or if it's with home health or whatever, but where we're trying to help people have something to do, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not trying to say that there is, but we're making arts and crafts. And that's fine. That can give you a sense of, you know, this is fun, or, or could, you could be doing it in a social setting. That's all fine and good. But what I'm saying, it is not the same thing, though, as finding purpose in which this child needs me in that mentoring program. Or I'm leading this book club study or something, you know, whatever it might be. There's a difference between just doing something to keep busy and doing something where you know you're helping someone or that someone's counting on you. Two different things. There is an aqueduct in Spain. It was built way back when. But the town decided that they were going to put in a new water supply to come down the mountain, bring the water down the mountain into the village. But they wanted to save that aqueduct. So they put in all the plumbing, all the pipes and all that to bring the new water down. And then they were going to like make it a historical marker, the, the aqueduct. But what they didn't know was that the sun was going to bake it and the mortar and it all began to crumble. And it all began to fall apart. That that they were trying to save. And it was because there was no water going down to keep it cool. My friends, that water is purpose. If your older adults that you love or caring for do not have that sense of purpose, they're going to crumble like that aqueduct. From a Princeton and UCLA study, older adults who rarely or never felt useful were nearly three times as likely as those who frequently felt useful to develop a mild disability and were more than three times as likely to have died during the course of the study. Purpose. I was speaking at an event in Iowa, and a, a woman came up at break, and she, she was headed toward me, and I could see her face, and she looked pretty upset, and I thought, oh my, what did I say? You know, I was trying to review everything I'd said. To, I thought, I made her mad. She said, oh no, it's not you, honey. And I said, okay. And she said, I'm mad at my friends. Okay, tell me about that. Well, do you know what they want me to do? No. They want me to put on my house robe and sit around and watch soap operas with them all day long. And she said, they even taped some of the old soap operas so that I would know who was married to who, who had whose baby, who had amnesia, all of that. She said, do you know what I told them? And quite frankly, I was a little concerned to ask, but I did. No, ma'am, what? She said, I told them, you're dead, you're just not buried. <laughs> that is wisdom. That is wisdom because she knew there was more to life. Even as she faced the challenges of aging. Than to sit around and watch soap operas all day. Now, if you watch soap opera, it's okay. It's all right. But not to make your life all about that. The true enemy of aging is complacency. It's when we just don't care. That's when we tend to go to the recliner and stay and say, I'm done. Life becomes stagnant. When an older adult loses a sense of purpose, they fail to invest in their own well-being. They just don't care. And yet, you hold a tool that can help them rediscover that purpose. In a Mather Institute research study, nursing home residents heard an announcement by the nursing home administrator, and each of them received a houseplant. 
half of the residents were told that the plant was theirs to care for as they saw best. The other half were told that the nurses would take care of the plant for them. And you know where this is going, right? The ones, the residents who were encouraged to make choices and take responsibility ended up displaying greater well-being, uh, activity, and alertness relative to the comparison group. They may think that they can't do it. They may have convinced themselves that it's too much trouble. But if you think about how investing in their sense of purpose makes your job easier and makes their life better, then it's certainly worth thinking about. So these are linked closely together. Choices, a sense of responsibility for oneself, obviously within limitations, but, and having purpose. Research shows that having a sense of purpose is associated with a higher quality of life, a keener sense of well-being, and even physical and mental health as you grow older. All right. Now I'm probably going to step on some toes Here's a warning, and if I had to sum up in one phrase the biggest concern I have for older adults today, this would be it. Sitting all day with cable news turned on, blaring in the background. I see this over and over and over again, and I'm not saying what station, whatever. I don't care what end of the spectrum they're on. But if they are listening, if that has become the soundtrack to their day, it is eroding their well-being. When I'm speaking to older adult groups themselves, and I come to, to this or tell this story or whatever, they're like, you see heads nodding or looking at each other, you know, and whatever. And then later, a wife will come up and say, thank you for saying that because that's what he does. I had lunch with my college roommate probably about a year ago, and, and uh, I said, how's it going? And she said, oh, because her husband had just retired. And she said, oh, it's awful. I was like, what? You know, I expected her to say they were going on a trip, they were doing this, that. And she said, no, he's doing the one thing I ask him not to do. I said, what's that? She said, he gets up in the morning, he turns on cable news, it's on all day long. He's in there arguing with them. As they get louder, he's getting louder. So one of the things I tell older adult groups, I said, I want you to limit it to 30 minutes, 30 minutes a day. I want you to know what's going on in the world, but the rest is just all banter. The rest is just one commentator talking over the other commentator. And if you can feel your blood pressure going up and your stress level going up, it's beyond time to turn it off. So I don't know if you are experiencing this. How many of you experience this? with people that you care for, or, yeah. It is out there, people. And if you're not aware of it, make yourselves aware of it. I mean, I can walk down in an assisted living center and the doors will be propped open and it's, it's you know, loud and it's on and on and on. If it's becoming the soundtrack to your day or to their day, it is not healthy. So don't, <laughs> I encourage them not to marinate, okay, in uh, cable news. Typically, the older we get, the less contact we are likely to have with others. For many, television becomes their primary companion. You know that. I'm less concerned if it's the Hallmark station, okay? I'm less concerned about that. Older adults are the largest consumers of cable news, which makes uh, which includes much negative and uh, politicized content, and that is a daily stress. I mean, that's been proven over and over. So, I want you to discuss this in your group. What has been your experience with older adults watching television, particularly cable news? Okay, I want you to take a few minutes and talk to your group about that.
Okay. <clears throat> I want you to be thinking about how you might could help with that situation. And I do think that one of the ways that we can do that is to help them find purpose. Tools for helping older adults find a renewed purpose in late life. Uh, it'd be interesting to ask them, say, what, what is your purpose? Why do you think you're still here? There's a, a line that I love. Seniors are survivors earmarked for special assignment. We take on a totally different point of view when we think we're here for a reason. There's something we are to be doing. What are their skills, their gifts, their talents, their experiences? What are they passionate about? Maybe you know this and maybe you don't. Maybe you think you know. Maybe you need to have that conversation. When are they in the flow? You know, when, when time just passes by because you're doing something you love so much. Have you watched this? Have you witnessed this with them? And if not, could you talk about that? Some real life examples. A woman in her 90s who loves to knit and crochet and offers classes for younger generations and also knits blankets for a women's shelter. Her church family keeps her well stocked in yarn and also provides personalized cards that say made in love and in her name. Every day, she has immaculate degeneration. She's legally blind, but she can still do baby blankets because she's done it for so long. She knows exactly the number of counts, and she can just do that easily. She gets up every day with that in mind. And what's been really cool is that women from the women's shelter have come down to meet her. And it also keeps the church engaged because they are there to see that that basket is full of yarn. A retired art teacher creates paintings that are reproduced into note cards and sold for mission efforts at her church. A woman in her mid-80s gives free piano lessons to other residents of her senior community and also at a boys and girls club. An older woman in senior living got a dog after her husband's death. She and her dog went through the special training for pet therapy. And now she and her dog visit residents of an assisted living and of uh, memory care. A former teacher who now lives in assisted living is uh, leading a memoir writing class for fellow residents. Each week, they take one or two prompts and write their answers. Helping them is helping her. One week, maybe it is, describe your childhood home in terms of all your senses. What was your first paid job? How did you learn to drive? And let me just say that that group that she has in her memoir writing class has become so close because each week they share their stories with each other and they're learning things about each other. They become very tight. It's not about her being so much the English teacher to correct where the comma goes or doesn't go, she doesn't do much of that. She's there as an encourager, but it took someone to plant that idea in her mind. She did not come up with it on her own. It was when she was asked, would you, that she was like, I can do that. Purpose. An 89-year-old retired Air Force officer uses his leadership skills to organize the weekly donations at a local food pantry in his hometown. This was a man that I knew. He was widowed after being a caregiver for his wife for probably at least 10 years, and he was lost. He was lost. He had no idea what to do with his time, with his energy, and he was still pretty much a go-getter. Took one person, one person in our church, who knew his leadership abilities. And she said, Ed, would you be willing to come up once a week on Mondays, which is usually they've had big donations over the weekend, 
and just organize the food pantry. You do it how you think it needs to be done. And he did. And every Monday he was there till the day he died. It just took someone to ask him. Even those who are frail can find purpose. This is not a picture of the actual gentleman that I knew, but I knew a gentleman that was spent his day in a wheelchair. He lived in a half of a room in a nursing home, spent his days either in bed or in the wheelchair. He was the most popular guy in that entire nursing home because he was known as the high five guy. He would give high fives to anybody passing by, always with the word of encouragement. That was his purpose. I was sitting visiting with him one day, and there was a man that came by that was a double amputee, a much younger man. And he looked in the door where we were visiting, and the older friend saw him, and he gave him an air high five. And I watched them as they did this together, and then both broke into a huge grin. The thing is, what's happened is so often, older adults will think, well, that's not important. Oh, but it is. It is. And he needed to be told how important it is. He may have been doing more good in that nursing home than anybody else. Because he was there to encourage day after day after day. So don't fall into the trap of making excuses about why you can't help an older adult find new purpose. So it'd be easy to say, well, yeah, you don't understand. He or she has a physical dis disability or they, have tr they, you know, they can't drive, they don't have transportation. But I'm asking you, please don't go there. If you know what somebody's gifts and experiences and passions are, find a way. Find a way. Be, get creative. Instead of just letting it drop, see if you can find plan B. Find another way to make that happen. Lucy Marianne was one of those that couldn't drive, I was telling you about. And yet, she was the greatest encourager, just like I was telling you earlier. She would write me notes. She would give me a call. She didn't do it to just to me. I mean, she was so instrumental in the Boys and Girls Club that was there and and just so many different things. She was the encourager. She, as long as she had a phone and a pen and paper, she was good to go. She made use of it. But she needed that initial encouragement, you know, to say, this is something you can do, and you don't know what it means to me. I, I, had, a, um, I had a little flipbook calendar called Spirit Boosters, it's just like a little daily devotional that repeats over each year and whatever can be reused. And I was trying to decide who I was going to dedicate it to. And so there were two women, and one of those was my childhood Sunday school teacher. And she lived to be 104. And on her 104th birthday weekend, we literally were signing copies together of Spirit Boosters. Because she would write me letters. I would send her a card. She would write me a letter. And the letter would always include something about your, your mother and daddy would be so proud of you. Well, let me tell you, you can be 70 whatever years old and you hear that and it feels good. She found a way to be an encourager. So now I want you to think of an older adult in your circle of influence, who is struggling to find purpose as they age and think about their gifts and experiences. And then I want you to write three ways that you might help direct them to find new purpose in late life. And we're going to share these, so be thinking.
Okay. So I'll keep boys right now because it's getting boring really quick. But um, then it was the youngest one has sleep issues, and so we have to give him medicine. So he sleeps heavier, and so he's eight, and so somehow he's making up for it. And so the other day he's put me down. He goes, Mom, this is embarrassing. I'm eight years old and I'm having a co-op. He goes, No one wears this. I go, My grandma, your great grandma, who's 95, wears a co-op. He goes, She does. He goes. So if I live long enough, I have to start all over. <laughs> and I just thought, it's so his whole mind was about that. that. I thought, how That's precious. That's pretty precious. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's hear what you have to say. Let's, let's do at least one per table or more if we have time. Let's go at this table. That's cool. That's really wonderful. Let us know when you have it. I'd love that. That's great. That is wonderful. You know, that's one thing. I'll encourage churches. I said, you know, use the artwork of your older adults, or maybe it's an, uh, maybe it's an intergenerational thing where you have older adults working with kids. Use that on your screens instead of, you know, commercial. Use, take a Sunday where you honor what their work is. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, but I, I hear you. Um, I was with uh, a doc uh, two weeks ago who has a child, and I think she's had three, four, four at care, four to three days. And she said, oh, wait, I was curious to see if it was something. It's something I'd never seen before. She said, can you just send it to me? So, you know, I, we have a new generation that we, we I'm a third grade teacher for two, but I don't control it anymore, but I could if I wanted to. She's making. With their and, games. And it's called Whole Soul. S E Whole Soul. And so these are these are pictures that you can hold in your hand. And some of these mothers want to hold their 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 baby. And these are little they're not like they're not like infant clothes. So if you ever look it up online, uh, my son is making the most beautiful embroidery. Yes, that's a wonderful example. That's a wonderful example. I've just never seen it. Mm -hmm. I've never thought about it. I've never thought about Did someone ask her to do that? Or, yes. Uh -huh. See? Yes. Uh, Isn't that cool? Love that. And I love that it, it took a, a person to reach out to her and say, would you do this? You know, uh, someone that had to know that she had that ability and that experience and whatever. Cool. Y'all have something? Okay. Well, it's not that they don't know. They, they don't know that they have purpose. We know they do, but you don't, okay? So...
That's great. That is great. To share and to fellowship. How about this table? There you go. You know, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, that can really be beneficial. Yeah. Anybody else at this table want to share? Uh-huh. Okay. So, there you go. That's great. Do you hear that? So, again, another one about crocheting and taking the children's hospital. Fabulous. Okay, this group, Anybody? So, so they need to find a renewed purpose, is what you're saying? No. Or have they made their purpose watching TV? They may be. They may, they may say they're content and they're happy. Yeah. But, it's, but I think there still is a very big difference between that and really finding purpose. If if there's some way to take what those experiences were. To <laughs> He's good at helping you find your purpose. There. <laughs> and, okay. Anybody else at this table? The bats. Homeless. That is that is a huge. That, that's kind of a nationwide thing, and it is really great. My cousin's very involved in that. So cool. All right, this table back here. You have something? Uh huh. Yeah. That's cool. There was a man um, I met in Tennessee at a, a, a large uh, senior living community. And the staff would, um, whenever there was a fallen tree on campus, because they had a lot of trees, they would make sure that part of the wood was saved and whatever, and then he had the the ability to either make pins out of out of the wood, but he especially liked making hand crosses that he would give away. But it was kind of a connection between the staff knowing that he needed the wood and that they would provide that for him, and then he would use it, and then he would just give them away to bless people, as he would say as well. Anybody else at that table? Okay, next table. Uh, sure. Yes. Yeah. That that is hard. I mean that that is because for the most part I'm not talking about memory care folks and whatever. Although um, there is there is it's trying to tap into that. Yeah. Yeah. I know one. There's a, a one lady that I know is in memory care, and um, 
she loved to dance and whatever. So she kind of took it upon herself to lead, you know, lead the group in dances and whatever because she had not lost that ability. So, you know, but I understand what you're saying. It is, it's a special challenge, I think, with memory care. Yes, anybody? At the Very cool. Oh, that's neat. Uh-huh. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. Anybody else at that table? Okay, let's back to this table. Uh, wow. And, and that's the thing about that purpose and what it may, you know, what it is now may not be what it's going to be tomorrow. And, and so there is that transition and whatever. Or, you know, you may, maybe you had been that English teacher and the last thing you want to do is to do more English stuff, okay, whatever. And that's okay, you know. Maybe it's something brand new. But the point is that we, we have to help each other kind of figure out those things that will give us that good feeling of knowing that we've contributed Okay, that group, the very back. Yeah, y'all. Okay, anything here? Oh, wonderful. Okay, wonderful. I hope, hope you'll hear some more this afternoon, too, that might be helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Last table. <laughs> Sure. So, great one. Thank you. Uh, and that's a good one, too, you know, sharing those recipes. Absolutely. Thank you all for sharing that. We're going to stop now, have lunch, and be back here at 1240. Oh, go for it.